Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And right now it's time for a hot topic. We're talking about how over 80% of Nigeria's crude oil has been stolen. And that is being said by the former president, Olusegun Obasanjo. He made this statement saying that over 80% of Nigeria's crude oil has been stolen. And joining us to just review this and talk about it in depthly is Joe Femi Danguru. He's a public policy analyst and yeah, that's who we're going to be having today. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good to be here. Okay. So, former President Olusegun Basanjo came out to say that over 80%, and that is quite a large number, um, of Nigeria's crude oil has been stolen. So, whatever we're working with right now, is about 20%. Um, I want to know your thoughts on this statement. Uh, basically, sometimes I just feel that why is it that uh, when our leaders want to leave their position of leadership, uh, it seems their eyes are becoming, or their eyes become so clear to see a lot of things. Uh, the gentleman, Chief of the Ambassador was there as a military leader. He was there as a civilian uh, president. So he, he should know a lot of all this. Thing. So we won't take it uh, for granted that what he has just said is, is, uh, is not important. It's quite important to have this figure. But my concern and my thought has always been when they were there or when he was there, what was his effort? What was that effort made to cop the uh, is still in the meeting and every other thing that was going on because it's not just now, you know. So there should have been a kind of intelligence report uh, to the president as I did, and he should have been able to wade into some of those things. But, you know, they should tell us what they did. He should have said, look, I know this thing when I was there, and these are the actions I took, and these are the actions that should be taken and make suggestions. It is not just enough to tell us that, look, this is what is being stolen. And yes, who we know, uh, then what do we do? How have we been bat battling the, 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 the theft? So those are the things that we should be hearing and not just making all this open end kind of comment. Yes, it's good to know that it's been stolen since uh, years, uh, maybe how many years it has been stolen, what have we done, what should we do? But now we are seeing the president uh, the new president, uh, President uh, Bola Metinubu, with the efforts of the military, with the efforts of uh, other good citizens and consultants and people who are, you know, uh, pursuing or trying, making, you know, fantastic effort to cut this uh, theft. So that is what we should be talking about. How do we cut the theft? So how do we improve on what we have? How do we sell those things legitimately? to the benefit of the citizens of Nigeria. I think that is what is important. That is what the people want to hear. They are fed up of hearing 80% stolen, 70% stolen. They are fed up of all this figure. They want to see this thing being, so, uh, being sold appropriately. And the money coming back to Nigeria it through the right channels so that the NMPCL will declare exact amount that has been, that has been sold, exact amount that has come into the government coffer, and they will begin to see the reality. That is what's important to the masses and not just the figure of what has been stolen or what is somewhere and not. Mm. So you talked about NMPCL coming out to, um, you know, let us know, but even the World Bank had accused the NMPCL of not being transparent in the numbers. Um, do you think that's going to happen? Because at this point, obviously, there's a trust deficit. Well, we don't even know whatever is going on. We don't know anything in regards to how much crude we produce, um, how, much is, how much is being sold for, nothing whatsoever. Do you think for them to be able to say, okay, this, this crude oil is not being stolen and we can account for it, is that where the NMPCL starts to bring some form of transparency to the masses? There should be transparency in all what the government is doing and what the government will do. You know, uh, it is not just the World Bank that uh, has told us this, just like uh, President uh, Obasanjo said it. Uh, a lot of our leaders, they know, they are aware of some of these things and they are finding ways. It's just, you know, when you look at Aramco, we, at some point, I think we said Aramco was interested in uh, partnering with us. You see the transparency in all these other places, you know, but 
the, the phone is this, or, or it's not the phone. The, the, the reality is this, that when we have uh, a company that is now a limited liability company or possibly in the near future to be a publicly quoted company, not declaring their assets, not declaring their profits. No, we do not know how money is being made or made, how money is being spent. And you know, we don't have the accurate figures of all these things. And for years, so now we have a president who said, look, let us figure it out. Let us do it right. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that is the most important thing now. We should figure it out. We should do the right thing. Enough of all this uh, bickering, enough of all these, enough of all these uh, political you know, uh, maneuvers. Let's begin to do the right thing. Let us come clean and say, this is what and what we are selling, and this is what we are making out of it, and this is what we have done with the money. Unless we begin to do things right, unless we begin to approach uh, the system correctly, uh, we cannot go to places and be saying, look, uh, we want investors to come. When we are not transparent with some of this, this is the major source of our income. And we should guard it uh, carefully. And we should guard it very well. And that is what we should do. So now that we have a new board of NMPC in place, let us know their mandates and let it be open. Let NMPC say, these are, these are, these are, these are what we have. Let us have investors relations uh, a program that they'll be able to say, this is what. Until we begin to have that, this should be displayed on their website. Everything should be transparent. Technology should be brought into this system, whereby we know when is this taken away, where it is at that very moment. And these are things that are so simple, and we should be able to do it right. Mm. OK. I think, um, I, I mean, I love the fact that you've said we should be transparent. But let's look at the root cause of the matter. We've seen this happen over time. For years, you know, they've always come out to say Nigeria's crude oil is being stolen, Nigeria's crude oil is being stolen. But why is this so persistent? Why is it that no administration comes in and puts an end to this? And also, is this a security issue or is it maybe a poverty issue, for instance? Um, people are so poor and they feel like the only way for them to be able to scale up is by stealing Nigeria's crude oil. Um, so what do you think is the root cause of the matter? Look at it this way. Uh, we can't just be uh, blaming everything on poverty. On you know, it's it's just our mindset. Most of the people, or some of the people that are being caught at some of these illegal refineries, you see, they, if you call them pro guys, okay, fine, or you know, low end people. Yes, where are the people behind the scene? How many people have been sent to jail? How many people have been prosecuted? You know, it is not those young men and women or so, or those ones that you see that have been, you know, arrested. There are people behind them that we, we, we can't just see. You know, I, I don't know much about that terrain, but I look at it that those behind them, have you seen any big name or anything? You think those guys that have been arrested are the ones selling this? Do you think they have the network or the contact? No. So it's beyond what we are seeing. And that is why um, sometimes it's quite difficult because it's a network. I mean, such networks are uh, highly, you know, connected somehow. So you can say security issue, but now that uh, I believe this government of President Bola Metinubo is serious about it much more. We are seeing efforts, the Nigerian Navy, we have a uh, Tan Tantia or something, uh, I've forgotten that name correctly now, uh, that gentleman who has the contract to monitor and to you know, possibly arrest the people or hand them over to the police or to the Navy. We see a lot of activities going on now, unlike before. So let us see how, you know, sometimes you just have to wait and see how each government performs. Uh, and that is why I'm looking at this ones that we are seeing now. But until we get to the grassroots of it, to the root cause of this thing, the root cause we know, the root cause is because some few individuals, they want to be richer, or they want to be wealthier, and they think that is the only way. Crime will always be committed, one way or the other, all over the world. But it is for the government to put things in place, to put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 
laws in place that we that we guide and that we take care of those things. So uh, if if you try to beat them this way, they go the other way. That is it, and that is why we have to be consistent. That that's why we have to be proactive, and it is you know it's itself for all of us to be concerned and to be able to do things right. Mm. So staying on the transparency issue, and you said crime will always, you know, happen. Do you think that the reason why the federal government and the NMPC all isn't coming out to um, say what exactly the numbers are is because of, you know, them wanting to perpetuate crime as well? So it is for corrupt reasons. Do you think that? Well, you see, I don't want to guess. I don't want to speculate why... Uh, an organization will do one thing or not do another thing. For me, is let us encourage them. Let us tell them this is what the people want and let them do it. I think the people who are there, they know it. The new chairman of the board of directors of NMPC uh, is a gentleman that has worked uh, all his years in the oil industry. He knows what transparency is all about. Uh, Shifa K. Elua is somebody that uh, you know I know as well. And so uh, we believe with him at the helm of our fear right now, we should be able to give a good uh, guideline and to get the, the the, 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 the board and the, the entire organization to do the right thing. Uh, and uh, good enough, he was uh, immobile when the, the president was uh, appointed, uh, apparently, and uh, he worked together with him. So they know what it is. Uh, having worked uh, with such an international organization and uh, seen what uh, they've done there. So let's hope that this one will bring a new idea, you know, into the whole system. And it's just like annually, like every other company we do, they declare their assets, they declare profit and loss, you know, they just come out clean with an audited account. Annually. This is supposed to be annually and there's supposed to be quarterly reports, monthly reports, uh, you know, so these are simple things that you expect them to do. So we watch and see if things will change within the next uh, few months and we begin to understand it. And if not, I think we can still discuss it further then. Mm -hmm. Okay. A few weeks ago, um, I had an interview with you and we spoke extensively about um, the parliamentary system of government. And I remember you saying you do not care whether it was parliamentary, elementary, whatever it is, as long as we have like a better and thriving economy and a better Nigeria. But do you think that if we switch in into a parliamentary system of government can help combat this issue of oil theft? I, I, I'll tell you again that it's about people it is, you see, the system, no matter how good, how creative, how good, how superior a system is, people will operate it. People. So it is the people, and it's the conscience of the people. You know, it, it is not because we are operating uh, a parliamentary system or we are doing presidential or whatever system we will operate. The system is as good as the people operating it. You know, you can buy the best car. If you don't know how to drive a car, you have collision with the car, you have a terrible accident with the car, and only God will save you if you don't buy it. So it is not just buying the brand new car, it is not buying the most expensive car that matters. You have to know how to drive the car, you have to have a license to drive it. A lot of things goes into that. So it is not about just having the parliamentary system. The people will driving. So who are the people again? The election, the, the campaign, how do people source the money for the election campaign? And uh, it, all these things will come up again. Forms will be sold by the parties. And if one person is buying a form of 100 million, how do we control that? You know, so a lot of all these things will happen. The people will go into the parliament. They will, I mean, you have the policies now in place, you have the laws in place, you have the oversight policies in place. So what stops the same people from, you know, doing their job? So it is not the system per se. If we are talking about, you know, low cost and whatever, the people, so until when we have people who are conscious of this, people who are, you know, sincere about bringing Nigeria forward, about moving this country forward, about going there to serve, are not going there to be selfish. What we have in most cases is selfishness. It's a personal aggrandizement. It is where people don't think about humanity. It is where people think about me, myself, and I. So we have to begin to look into that. It is the people, for goodness sake. It is the system can be any system, but the people who will drive the system, that is what matters. And by the way,
coming. This is not, I believe, every every four years you see people coming about this idea of constitutional reports and doing one thing or the other. I mean, people are getting fed up. This is not the right time to even bring this out now, in my own opinion, because people are thinking, the masses are thinking of how to feed themselves, how to feed their children, how to send themselves, their children to school. Let us look at this important agenda as Nigerian citizens, and let us begin to see that, look, which one is it? Look, now we don't have steady electricity. Let's focus on that. Let's monitor that. Let's achieve that. We don't have you know, food. The president declared uh, in August last year, he declared uh, a state of emergency on the food insecurity. What happened between August and December and January? I mean, we have people in this country. We have people in the ministry. The president has seen it as, you know, something might happen. Let's do. Now we're just running health as cater. Since that we have learned, we have we have gotten the order to proceed and to do the right thing. Then the IMF and the World Bank they said in October last year, I said things will happen this way. So who are those people not doing their job well? It's not the system. People will have to do their job well. People will have to be committed. You know, if we say look, we we, we are going to bring in. Uh, loans for students to have the loans, why can't we work it out and make it work? These are things that we should do. We have enough right now to do so that ASU will not go on strike and the minimum wage we can resolve that issue. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things on our hands right now. Mm. You know, we shouldn't bring things that will just confuse the people and people are not interested. Ask anybody on the street whether that is their concern right now. You know, that is not concern. I think that is just for the elites who want to, you know, begin to have, uh, you know, uh, meetings here and there and, uh, you know, possibly travel to Abuja to do things. People don't really, I think the majority of the people on the street, they don't really care about this now. They just want to see how to live well in this country. Yeah. I, I would agree with you because no matter what you're going to call it, if you're saying parliamentary, presidential, whatever it is, it's just on paper. It's still the makeup of the people who go there and if they're doing their jobs right. But like I said, there's a prevalence of this um, over time in Nigeria where you've seen oil theft. Now, I want to know, do you think this has impacted our economy? Because now you're talking about how people just want to live well and just feed their bellies because that's like the major thing at the moment. We're talking about food in, food in, um, short, shortage in food supply and people really don't have food. People can barely feed. People can barely make ends meet. Now, do you think this oil theft has impacted our economy like over time? I mean, sure. It's, it's, it's glaring. It's glaring. That is why I'm saying people are aware of this. Uh, previous government uh, was aware of it. Uh, it, it is not new to anybody uh, coming into the government. And that is why it takes guts, the guts of every leader to, you know, to just fight it head on and say, look, I'm going to put a stop to this. So, and I think that is what's important, uh, you know, the audacity to say, listen, uh, this cannot continue. You, you know, so, uh, which I think this government, you know, sometimes I, I just want us to begin to, you know, give people the chance of, you know, let's see how far he can go with it. We are seeing efforts being made in all, you know, areas of our economy. And sometimes this, you know, the central bank comes with policy. Uh, the policy might not be good enough, and then they will want to find a way to adjust or to modify. Then, you know, so I think a lot of these things that we have seen in the past have, you know, they really messed up the economy. Thank God we are not in a recession right now. But you see, when we talk about economy, it's a global issue. Global economy right now uh, is, is, is most diving in a way. Uh, you see a couple of other developed nations, they're having recessions, they're having problems, they're having crisis. Farmers in Europe are protesting, and a lot of all this is going on. But the point is that they always find a solution to it quickly. Within you know, they don't just go about begging and asking people, oh, come and help us, we have a problem. Oh, come on. They find a solution within themselves and they resolve the issue within themselves because they don't want to make themselves laughing stocks and they believe they are competent enough to solve the problem of their country. And this is where African leaders should begin to, you know, look inwards and not just everything you have issues you go about and say, okay, oh, he please help me and all that. Yes, you can ask for help. No 
doubt about that. But what are the issues? What are the solutions we can find locally? And how are we tackling this solution? Sincerely, you know, because if we say give us money, give us idea, give us things, and we take the money, if the money is not being utilized for what it's supposed to be for, if the contracts are being inflated, you know, a lot of things comes mm. up. And it is not unlike before. The global community sees what is going on. That's why we talk about transparency, because you cannot continue to do things the way you've been doing it before, you know. And you have citizen journalism. You have a lot of things that people will just expose some of these things. So we have to be very careful. So for me, the economy has been in bad shape for a long time to come. You know, for a long time before now, rather. So, and if care is not taken, we will still be in this, you know, don't you know I mean, for, for, for a long time. So, because we have to begin to find out, we continue to see technology we come with good result. People have to drive this technology. We have to invest in the right technology. We have to invest in the right educational programs. So, all of this is, if, if we are to set up more universities, what are these universities going to come up with? You know, so we want to set up more universities. We, want to, we have to be able to think of funding them. And if they're private universities, we have to think of how will the people have the money to fund them? You see, so a lot of all these things, we shouldn't just be talking about problems, problems, and problems. Let us begin to find solutions, local solutions, national solutions. It is not the government that controls the state. The state budgets their own money, their own projects. Are they doing it right in the state? Are they doing it right in the local government? Let's not forget the fact that these people are part of our system. And until when we begin to monitor them accordingly, until when we begin to look into what they're doing properly. So it is not just only the, the federal government, the states and the local government, they are part of this system. And we have to look into it. And you see, when we want to give money to uh, the so-called uh, uh, poor people, how do we, we don't have a good data to say this one we collect 75,000, 25,000, whatever we want to give. Let us have a good data. And that is why we have the social security, we have the social benefits in all this country is with data. You see, it is not enough for someone to say, look, uh, some millions were stolen in my bedroom in, in, in the government <laughs> house. Why do you take the, so much money to your bedroom in the government house mm. in the first instance? So anybody reading that that is not in Nigeria will just laugh and say, look at how these people are wasting money. So <laughs> these are things, they, they are simple things that ordinary people will just ask you, why, what is going on in that country? Yeah. I mean, these are the things we have to begin to look at. And then you look at the the, the you know, now Netflix is here, a lot of all these organizations, Showmax, all this, they're coming in and they're here making use of our local talent. Our local talents are bringing in hundreds of millions and billions into the economy. So let us tap more into this local economy and let us think of how to do things to export. If we don't begin to export to generate uh, foreign exchange, how do we hope to have more foreign exchange in this country? So the, the problem is what we know, what an ordinary person knows. And if you ask, when we are setting up this economic committee, economic mm. council and whatever, let us put ordinary people sometimes, let us put them in, in, in it. Let ordinary people that will say it raw, that will say it the street, you know, the way the street we understand it. Let, let them share their opinion. Let them share their thoughts about some of these things. I know it's good to have uh, professors, to have doctors, to have, uh, you know, uh, business um, rules here and there. But let us have ordinary people, you know, let us hear their opinion as well. Because sometimes most of these people don't go to the market. They don't see what you see, what I see, until we begin to understand that. And then they have the feedbacks that they want to hear. People tell them what to hear, not what they want to see. So let us begin to engage the common man, put yeah. it that way, in all the systems as well. It is not just uh, the so-called big guys that have to sit down alone and decide. Let's involve the common man on the street into some of these things. I think that is clear, clearly understood. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I like what you said about, you know, starting from the local government, because at the end of the day, they're all part of the system. And we need to look into the grassroots. A lot of times we blame the federal government saying the government is not working, the government is not working. But then how do you engage, you know, your local government chairman? How do you engage your councillors? How do you engage your state governor? Even before you move it up to um, the ministers and then the presidents. But 
I, I like what you've said about everything. Let's stay on the crux of the matter, which is the oil theft now. What are some long-term solutions you think, you know, can be introduced to ensure that we reduce it significantly or even eliminate um, the fact that, you know, a lot of our, oil, oil, our crude oil is being stolen? And as the case might be, former President Obasanjo said, uh, over 80% of our crude oil has been stolen. So what are some long-term solutions or policies that you even think the government can introduce to ensure that this you know, doesn't happen again and it's, we just combat it and eliminate it totally? I, I think this is sometimes the, the, the way uh, our pipes have been laid here and there. Uh, you know, they, they are porous, or they are just open to some of these uh, uh, pipeline busts. We have to use technology to co to combat some of these things, and we have to and we get the people as well. You know, everything is about the people. Where these things are based on, uh, people see them, and who are the people still investing? They are not ghosts. They are citizens of this country in Konawa with some other people. So when we begin to look at the technology, we can have a technology to monitor the whole thing. And once it's been properly monitored, it will be easier to, to detect where these things have been stolen, how it's been taken away. I mean, you can't just, you know, uh, take a badge or a, a shipload of oil out of this country without anybody seeing it. Let's, let's be candid with some of these things. So let us be very, very uh, helpful to this country. And let us begin to approach issues with, uh, you know, with the mindset of this is my country. It is a country that I want everything good. I want good for this country. Until we begin to get into that, because most people will say, what is my business? Nigeria is not good for me. But once we live in this country, and we understand this country, and we understand, we appreciate living in this country, it is then be, most of these things will become uh, easier to manage and to monitor. This is what is going on, where people around the world, uh, in some of these developed countries, they, they, they just appreciate their country. They know this is our country. They are Americans appreciate their country. Maybe the Germans appreciate you know, Germany. All these people. So until when we begin to speak well, but to make people to speak well about their country, when they discover that somebody has stolen the oil and then it comes back and then becomes a big man in the society, you think the people don't know them, they know them, but they can't say anything, they can't talk about it. So until when we begin to make people to make them you know, not just feel it, it, just become part of it. We have to be passionate about this. We have to talk, you know, to the mindset of the people that, look, this is your country. And before you can say that, they want to see you do what you preach. That is what is it. They want to see you do what you preach, and that is what is important. Mm. You know, our churches have to be part of it. Our mosques have to be part of it. Yes, we want to go to heaven, but, you know, People will tell you, yes, I want to go to heaven. Yes, but I have to enjoy what God has given me. Mm -hmm. God has given us this. We are not buying it from anywhere. It is right here with us. It's a gift. And we have to let everybody partake in this gift. It yeah. is not for just one person. It is for the, the whole Nigeria. So if you are looking at it from the from the religious dimension, from whatever dimension you want to look at it, it's a gift from God. And God knows what he has given us. So yeah. let us not begin to, you know, damage this country. For every crew that is turning is a damage to the mm. society. It's a damage to the yet unborn citizen. We shouldn't be in debt like this. And we should be able to see ourselves as you know, brother's keeper. It is not enough for one man to just build a mansion. It is not just one man for just to have about 20 cars or put mm. for whatever proof. And just one man in the community. And the rest community, the rest of the community are suffering and they're begging for rights. That is not what it should be. We should be a brother's keeper. Let us practice what we preach. Not yeah. just putting on a badder every day and showing class. That <laughs> is not what Nigeria should be. We are good people and let us remain good people. Unless we take it to the grassroots, unless we take it to the primary school, to the nursery school, you, will see, you can be in shock when you see even children primary school, nursery school, condemning their country and telling you that I want to go out of this country, a child, a five-year-old. That, that is what he hears. That is what they discuss. That's the new let Nigerian dream. You know, and, and let us begin to do the right thing. It is not whether parliamentary, elementary, whatever. I said it again. It is the people who drive this. And the people are most us, we, Nigeria, you and I, and every other people out there that is hearing this. But they will say, what is this saying? The politicians are not hearing. Yes, until when we make them hear it, we go to the constituency offices and we begin to drop letters. We begin to make them feel it. 
I will begin to provide their telephones and to say, look, I want to see you. I want you to change this narrative. When we begin to do that, the citizens have a role to play. And once we play this role, it is not just strike of a day or two. That will not even send any signal to them because they know after two <laughs> days, we still go back to face the reality. So doing these strikes and whatever may not really help until when we begin to do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with them, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, agitation with them yeah. for them to understand it. If there's a strike, they'll just stay in their house and they won't go anywhere. And they're enjoying their house. There's electricity for them 24 so they don't have the problems you and I have. So that is not touching them. You know? So we have to find a way to make sure they understand what we are talking about. Don't allow people to steal our crude oil. Because if you know those who are stealing this crude oil and we don't say anything, let the Lord take his course. Just like the Navdak woman said it, you know people who are bringing uh, right, expired drugs or fake drugs into this country. What is it? You find them just maybe 50,000 and the man has made 500 million. What is 50,000? Mm -hmm. Let us review those kind of laws. Let us bring it, not just say we want to change the system of government. That is not the main issue right now. Let okay, us sir. Agenda. Let us monitor it. Let us do what is right and let this country move forward for goodness sake. Enough of all this talk, talk, talk. We know what is right. Let us just begin to do it. All right. Easy. I think that's a very good way to end. We know what is right. Let us do what is right. And I love the fact that you highlighted the fact that um, our natural resources are a gift from God and all Nigerians should be a partaker of this gift, not a select few. So we want to say thank you for coming and just sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Good to be here. Thank you. All right, we'll be speaking to Joe Femi Dangoro. He's a public policy analyst. And we'll be talking about how um, about 80% of Nigeria's crude oil has been stolen, and that was being said by the former president, Olusegun Obasanjo. We'll go on a short break. When we return, we'll be talking about the businesses and the clampdown um, on them trying to find how to move across or move above the forex crisis that we are on right now. Please stay with us. <laughs> 